Hello and uh, welcome to this discussion. The topic today is nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, although the textbooks, the usual surgical pathology textbooks, uh, give a small portion of the discussion of Hodgkin lymphoma to this particular entity, it's actually a pretty complicated one. And uh, with the multiple types of histological presentations that can occur in this particular tumor, you actually end up with quite a few differential diagnoses. And the objective of this particular discussion is to stress on the various histological patterns aided by the use of immunohistochemistry and how you can utilize those in order to segregate them from the usual histological mimics. So a few things before we start off with our discussion of the cases. One entire slide of boring text. I usually don't like to put much of text in my discussion, but in this particular case, we'll have to, we'll, we'll need to have a little bit of the idea of the clinical presentation of the disease that we are talking of and the various outcomes that can be expected in patients of this disease. So uh, as we all know, it's predominantly a disease of children and the young age patients. And most of the times it's got a good prognosis in the sense that the disease is located to one or two lymph nodal regions, usually above the diaphragm, and the usual presentation being the stage one or stage two disease. However, in around 20% of the cases, we can have dissemination to the liver, lung, and the bone marrow. And these are usually the ones which present with the variant kind of histology, like for example, pattern E, D, or F. We shall talk more about those histological patterns later. B symptoms, that is a usual constellation of findings of fever, weight loss of more than 10%, unexplained over, a six, uh, over more than a six months period, and night sweats. These are usually uh, aggressive, uh, these are usually markers of high volume disease. And these are most often not seen in the case of NLPHL. However, in around 20% of the cases, you might see them, and those have got a worse prognosis. The, um, and many of these diseases will involve the region of the cervical or the axillary regions, the cervical nodes or the axillary nodes. Unlike the classic Hodgkin lymphoma, EBV association is exceptional. So that's an important thing that needs to be kept in mind. Most of the time by Hodgkin lymphoma, we usually, you know, we usually keep talking about the association with EBV. But in this particular form of Hodgkin's, you don't have the association with EBV. Rather, these cases are associated with the primary immunodeficiency syndromes in some of the cases. And uh, the atypical tumor cell, that is the LP cell, is basically derived from the clonal germinal center B cell. And uh, that means that this atypical LP cell is a normal mature B cell, expecting, uh, and you expect to see the entire range of positivity of the B cell markers along with the nuclear transcription factors of the B cell type. And uh, there are six histological patterns to it. And uh, as I've already said, there's the pattern A and B, which are the commonest histological patterns that you see. There is a pattern C in which it looks predominantly like the pattern B, but there's a little bit of spread of the LP cells out of the nodules. And pattern D and pattern E are the, are the variant histological patterns, which are most often associated with high stage disease, stage three and four. Now, many of these patients will have a relatively okay course. However, an important, thing about this particular disease is that it's prone to develop recurrences, multiple recurrences in the course of time, uh, uh, especially, and there is also an increased risk. There is a dreaded risk of a transformation to the large B cell lymphoma. And in this case, that large B cell lymphoma might look like something which is known as a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma, but it could also look like diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And to make things worse, in a certain tumor, in a particular tumor, you could have areas looking like NLPHL as well as like DLBCL and THR LBCL. Now, this, this cases with the variant patterns, that is pattern D, E, et cetera, and especially pattern E, they're most often associated with bone marrow, liver, and spleen involvement. And lastly, the transformation should be suspected on histological grounds. If from the nodular pattern, you have a transformation to a diffuse sheet-like area, which can be further aided by immunohistochemical strains like CD21 and CD23. Okay, so before we start off with uh, the cases and the immunohistochemical presentation of the cases, let me talk a little bit about the expected cytology of these cases and the immunohistochemical presentations of those particular tumor cells, right? So in the case of NLPHL, you basically have three important players. You have the background population, 
that is the background lymphocyte population. You have the atypical large cell population, which in this case is the LP cell, which is primarily called the popcorn cell. And you have a population of rosating T cells around the LP cells. We'll have to talk about the individual immunohistochemical findings of each of these of each of these cells. So the background lymphocytic population in most of the cases will be mature small B lymphocytes. But in the case of the variant patterns, that is the pattern D, E, et cetera, you will have predominantly the background cells as T cells. Make note of this particular discussion because uh, you know this is going to be the thing that will come of aid when you are going to discuss the histological and the immunohistochemical differential diagnostic profile. The atypical large cell population, that is the LP cell, is basically nothing but a mature B cell, right? It's a malignant cell, but it's of the mature B cell phenotype. So you expect a positivity for the entire gamut of mature B cell markers. So what are those B cell markers? We already know CD20 is the classic one, but instead of that, you could also use CD, uh, CD19. You could use CD79A, okay? And not only that, you could also use transcription factors as IHC markers. And these transcription factors are basically those which are expressed during the normal course of B cell maturation. So these transcription factors would include those like OC2, BOB1, PU1, PAX5, BCL6, etc., etc. Okay, so your atypical LP cell will express all that. It, in addition, it would express some other markers like EMA, etc. CD30, like of course, we'll have to talk about CD30 and CD15, right? Because CD30 and CD15 are the markers for the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, which is the closest differential diagnostic mimic of these LP cells. So CD30 is usually absent. Occasionally, you might get a CD30 positivity, but CD15 expression is very unusual in the case of LP cell. So that's your LP cell phenotype. And like I said, there will be a population of T cells which will rosette around these LP cells. So if you have your LP cell here, you will get a nice garland of T cells which, which surround these LP cells, right? So these LP cells will naturally, as they're T cells, they will express CD3. And this being of the T follicular helper, uh, I mean, T cell type, they will also express CD4, CD57, PD1, and also these fancy markers like CXCL13 and ICOS. Okay, so with that particular backdrop in mind, you will have to analyze the cases as we as we go along, keeping in mind that I shall be stressing on the three important players: the background, the large background population, the atypical small scant large cell population, and the cells which rosette around those atypical large LP cells. <clears throat> Before I start off with this virtual case-based discussion series, let me acknowledge the sources from, uh, from which I've taken the slides. So these two slides are excellent resources for your surgical pathology images, the University of Leeds and the University of Michigan slide sources. Uh, I advocate uh, these two sites over the others because you get the entire range of immunohistochemical, uh, the, the immunohistochemical markers worked up along with the cases. So you, you, know, you tend to get the big picture you get to see the entire IHC profile of a certain tumor and you get the entire idea of the disease rather than just seeing the histology and thinking about what the IHC might be. Okay, the first case, you see that there is something happening over here in the lymph node, right? So you have something known as an effacement. For the first years, what would the effacement mean? Effacement would mean that there is a, no, uh, that there is a loss of the normal follicular architecture and these follicles have essentially been replaced by nodules of large size, right? You can, I guess you can appreciate these nodules over here, but there are absolutely no normal residual lymphoid follicles seen in this lymph node. So there is a there is an effacement of the lymph nodal architecture, which is of a predominantly nodular pattern, right? And this is one of the most important things to catch uh, NLPHL. The architecture will be nodular, although keep in mind that the pattern E might have a predominantly diffuse pattern. Within the nodules, if you look closely, you will see that there is a kind of a mottled appearance, as in it appears to be punctuated by areas which are slightly more pink than those of the background small lymphoid cells. And within these mottled areas, you get a population of plump histiocytoid cells, along with a population of large cells, which 
I am circling over here. I won't talk about how they look because, you know, at this power, you'll probably not be able to appreciate the finer details, but I guess you can appreciate the fact that these large cells stand out from the background small cell population. Let's go into a higher power. And here we have our large cells. Let's look at them at a closer detail. So these large cells are basically, they, they possess a vesicular nuclear chromatin, pale vesicular nuclear chromatin. You have a nucleolus which is, which is well appreciable, but which cannot be compared to the gigantic inclusion-like nucleolus that you see in the case of the hodgkin reed sternberg cells. And some of them have got a slightly folded popcorn-like configuration. So these are what was called, uh, I mean, what was called in the olden days of your as uh, your popcorn cells, then later called LH cells, and now we call them LP cells. The atypical large cell population of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma that kind of look like popcorns. Another area of the same case, which again shows you this atypical large cell population. I guess you can spot these large cells over here now easily. Okay. And observe that a couple of them have got a slightly infolded nuclear contours, like you see in the case of a regular popcorn. So what is the immune profile that you expect in these particular cells before we go into the immunohistochemistry? It's a mature B cell, right? So you expect all the kinds of markers that you expect in a mature B cell, 20, 19, 70, 90, along with the transcription factors like OCK2, BOB1, PU1, PAX5, strong nuclear expression, et cetera. And uh, around them, you expect a peripheral colorate of T cells. What type of T cells? Helper, uh, so the helper T cells, so they will express CD3, CD4, CD57, PD1, et cetera. But the bulk of the population of the small blue cells in the background, you expect them to be mature small B cells, which will be picked up with markers like CD20, CD19, et cetera. With that backdrop in mind, we'll need to go ahead and assess our immunohistochemistry slides. So let's start off with CD20. I'm first starting off with a absolutely scanner kind of a view, which shows you, you know, that the predominantly nodules, the nodular pattern is predominantly composed of cells which are of B cell phenotype. So the majority of the cells within these nodules will be of small B cell type. However, observe in the inset, you have an atypical LP cell, which is also highlighted with CD20, meaning that this LP cell is a mature B cell expressing CD20. And observe another thing, the population of cells which surround, which immediately surround these LP cells seem to not express CD20, meaning that they are not of the B cell lineage. These will be your T cell rosettes, which are present around the atypical LP cell population. Okay, so here you have got all these atypical LP cells, right? Atypical LP cells, and you have got a zone which is negative for CD, CD20 around the atypical T cells, meaning that these are the rosetting T cell population, which will be highlighted subsequently with CD3 rather, right? Now, what about the nuclear transcription factors? As you see, these atypical large cells are, show strong nuclear expression of transcription factors like PAX5, OCT2, and BOB1. How will you compare the strong nuclear expression? You will compare that to the small background B cells, and you see that the intensity of expression is the same as that of the background B cells. So these are normal mature B cells expressing mm -hmm. the nuclear transcription factor strongly, OCK2, BOB1, PU1, whatever. EMA, like I said, a few of these cases will express EMA in a membranous fashion. This EMA is again expressed in the LP cell population. And of course, since you have an atypical large cell with a prominent nucleolus, sometimes you might have a diagnostic issue of uh, a hodgkin reed sternberg cell. In fact, this particular cell might give you the impression of a binucleate AUSI kind of an appearance. But you see that the typical Hodgkin markers of CD15 and CD30 are all negative in this large cell population, right? So these are not hodgkin reed sternberg cells. Similarly, a usual Hodgkin reed sternberg cell would not express CD20 or the B cell transcription factor strongly. Okay, now coming to CD3, you see that within the nodules, you also have a substantial proportion of the T cell population. Most importantly, you see that this T cell population form collars around this atypical LP cell. So you have this LP cell in the center, which is surrounded by a T cell collar, right? LP cell, T cell collar. LP cell, T cell colorate. What are the other markers that you expect to be positive in these CD3 cells? 
these are of the T follicular helper cell type, right? So CD4, CD57, PD1. These are all markers that you expect to be positive in the same population of cells. So as you see, the same population of cells is also highlighted by CD4 and also by PD1. Okay, so you've got these nice rosettes or collars around the atypical LP cells. CD21. Now, what's the role of CD21? As you can see, there's these nice nodules which are highlighted by CD21, right? So CD21 is basically a follicular dendritic cell marker. Apart from CD21, you also have CD23 and CD35, which can be used as follicular dendritic cell markers. So the, important of, uh, the importance of using this particular marker is that it tends to highlight the nodular architecture of the tumor. So supposedly, if you have a problem with uh, identifying the nodular architecture of the tumor on h &E section, you could utilize these markers to pick out the nodular architecture. And the presence of this nodular pattern as highlighted by CD21 is especially important when you want to segregate a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma, which is basically an aggressive high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma versus a pattern E, nodular lymphocyte-predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, which has got an appearance like T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. Presence of any nodular pattern like this with CD21 would mean that your diagnosis is pattern E NLPHL and not T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. Keep that in mind when we talk about the differential diagnosis of pattern E versus a THR LBCL. Within, this, within these nodules, you can see that there is an expansion of the nodules by this population of lymphoid cells so, the, so that the follicular dendritic meshwork appears to be broken up and expanded at certain places. Now this second case, you again, you can appreciate a effacement of the architecture with a nodular configuration. Although the most important thing that is striking is the mottling that you see, the pinkish areas which seem to be interspersed within the nodules and outside the nodules. Okay, so within this pinkish mottled areas, if you look closely, you will see, so what do you expect to see in this pinkish mottled areas? You expect a population of macrophages and your LP cells, right? So when we look inside these areas, inside these mottled areas, you see that there is a population of plump macrophages with abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, apart from the small, small lymphocytes, but you also get a population of larger cells, right? A typical cell population. So these are your sparse population of LP cells, which you are seeing over here, and which you will further identify with immunohistochemistry. Right, so here, here you have a, a typical cell, which kind of resembles a binucleate Hodgkin, uh, I mean Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, right? Here you have a cell which looks a little bit like a popcorn. So again, we start off with our usual range of immunohistochemical markers. CD20 shows that your background is predominantly mature small lymphocytes. It also shows you that interspersed within these mature small B lymphocytes, you have the larger LP cells, which are also highlighted with CD20. You observe that there is a zone of negativity around these cells meaning that you will get the CD3 positive T helper cell collars around this atypical large cell population, right? So here you have, got, you have got the atypical LP cells and these negative cells on CD20 are basically the CD3 expressing T follicular helper cell collars, right? LP cell with CD20 and negative collars around these LP cells. CD79A, like I said, it's a mature B cell marker. It will show you the same kind of outcome. You get a background which is rich in small B cells Along with that, you also get a population of CD79 positive large LP cells, right? So you have the population of background small B cells, and you have these large atypical LP cells, which also stain with B cell marker CD79. But again, observe the non-stained portion around these atypical LP cells. These are your colors of the CD3, CD4 expressing T follicular helper cells. Now we move on to CD3. As you see, the population of the CD3 rich, uh, the, the CD3 cell component is relatively sparse compared to the CD20 positive population. An interesting fact that we observe over here at a higher power is that these cells seem to be clustered in a kind of a glandular fashion around a, what looks like an empty space, right? So these spaces are not really empty. These are occupied by your LP cells, which naturally will not stain with CD3. So they appear like holes, right? So let's see them at a higher power. You see that within these areas, you have these relatively 
poorly stained LP cell at the center surrounded by your rosette of CD3 positive T follicular helper cells, which are the other markers that you expect to be positive in these colors, CD57, PD1, CD4, etc. Okay. BCL6. BCL6 is a marker which is expressed in the LP cells as we see over here. But again, it's also a marker which can be expressed in the T follicular helper cells. So you see that there is expression, nuclear expression of the BCL6 even in the cell population of the small T cells which surround the LP cell population. OC2. OC2, BOB1, P1, etc. are the B cell transcription factors, right? So this B cell transcription factors will be naturally expressed in the LP cell because this is nothing but a mature B cell phenotype, right? So you see that the background population of small B cells are strongly expressing the nuclear transcription factor OC2, and so is the expression seen in the LP cell. Same is the case with BOB1, which is another nuclear transcription factor, which is also expressed in the background small B cells. This is also expressed with the same equal intensity in the atypical LP cell population. So as you see in this particular picture, we have in, in this particular case, which is taken from the journal article, we have, I have kind of summarized all the findings priorly in my prior discussion. You uh, have all these nodules of varying sizes coalescing together at some places. You have the predominantly small lymphoid population, but which is interspersed with this atypical large LP cells, which at some places can look a little bit like Hodgkin's, Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. Around the nodules, you have a peripheral colorate formed by the macrophage-like cell population. At places, you can have these LP cells arranged in clusters. And what about the IHC profile? I think we have already, we have already discussed that in detail. These atypical large LP cells will express all, almost all of the positive B cell markers like CD79, CD20, and also the nuclear transcription factors like OC2, BOB1, etc. BCL6 will be positive in the vast majority. LP cells will be usually negative for CD30. Now that's important because unlike Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells, these will usually not express CD30 and they'll be rarely positive for CD15. EBV, unlike classic Hodgkin lymphoma, is rarely positive in the case of nodular uh, in the case of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkins. Now, these are the two new IHC markers on the landscape. In cases where you find the histology and the IHC challenging, you could use STAT6 to your advantage. STAT6 is a marker which is positive in in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. It will not be expressed in the case of annual PHL. The background small B cells are of the mantle zone B cell type, meaning that they will express IgD. They will also be associated with the expanded population of CD21, CD23 positive follicular dendritic cells. And around the atypical large cells, you will get the color of the T follicular helper cells, expressing all those markers that are said, right? CD3, PD1, CD57, BCL6, etc. So like you see, in this particular case, we've got a nodular architecture. You have got these atypical large LP cells, which are surrounded by the by the colors of PD-1 expressing CD3 cells. And these cells express a strong nuclear positivity for OC2. This particular slide highlights the same, the same points. Basically, you have got a low power view, you have got intermediate power, and you've got a high magnification view. So the background population is predominantly CD20 expressing small B cells, but within that you get the large LP cells as well. The same issue is also highlighted with the B cell marker CD17NA and also with, with PAX5. OC2 is seen to be expressed in these atypical large lymphoid cells of LP. And you have the germinal centers uh, and you have the follicular dendritic meshworks, which highlight the nodular architecture of the tumor, give, uh, which can be appreciated by CD21. CD3 shows you that the background population is that the background CD3 expressing T cells are relatively sparse, but they kind of highlight the colorate-like arrangement around the atypical LP cells, which is further highlighted with markers like PD-1. Okay, so this is uh, this is a slightly unusual case. So here you have an overall appearance of NLPHL, and you have these small lymphoid cells with these atypical large LP cells, which are nicely positive for the B cell markers like CD20 and PAX5, and also BCL6. They're surrounded by the color of PD-1 expressing CD3 cells. However, unusually, this particular case shows a membranous as well as a small Golgi zone kind of a positivity for CD30. That is slightly unusual, but this kind of CD30 positive NLPHL cases are also known. However, CD15 is not expected to be positive in these cases, unlike Hodgkin. So for NLPHL, you have got the essential criteria as laid down by the WHO and you have got the desirable criteria. So 
for essential criteria, you need a nodular architecture because the name itself says that nodular and you will identify that nodular architecture by, like I said, you will utilize the, uh, the follicular dendritic cell markers basically. And uh, you have got the large atypical, atypical tumor cell population of the LP tumor cells, which we have already seen. And these LP tumor cells will show uniform positivity for multiple mature B cell markers because these are nothing but normal mature B lymphocytes. So they will express positivity for CD20 and also the nuclear transcription factors like OCT2, BOB1, etc. The background cells will be predominantly small B cells. However, you will get a color of T follicular helper cells which express PD1 around the atypical LP cells. Now, there are multiple growth patterns. And in fact, this particular discussion centers around that. In order to identify the growth patterns, uh, we will have to see a couple of the cases and look at the IHC profile of each of the cases. The important thing is the growth patterns need to be identified because you have to you know, separate the histological mimics from these cases. Having said that, it's actually sometimes difficult because the trend nowadays is for needle core biopsies. And with needle core biopsy, since you're not appreciating the entire architecture of the lymph node, talking about the entirety of the growth pattern becomes troublesome. But in excisional biopsy, you are supposed to mention the growth pattern that you see. So the usual growth pattern is what we have seen priorly. You get these large nodules of varying sizes, which are composed of predominantly small B cells with a scanty population of mature, large atypical LP cells, which are surrounded by the rosettes of your CD3, 4, 57, PD1 expressing T cells, right? Now there is a pattern B, which is a kind of an extension of the pattern A, as in you get all these nodules of varying sizes, but at some places you see that the nodule seems to be coalescing into areas which look slightly more diffuse architecture, right? So these areas of focal coalescence in a otherwise nodular kind of a background in NLPHL constitutes what is known as the pattern B. Like for example, you could see nodules over here, but over here it seems that two nodules seem to have coalesced into something which is larger, right? Within these nodules, again, you will see the same kind of an architecture. You will see the same background, predominantly background, small lymphoid population, which will be mostly small B cell, but along with that, you will get a mottling in those areas, which will have cells with slightly more eosinophilic cytoplasm, which will be a combination of macrophages and your atypical LP cells, right? So in these small lymphoid cell populations, you also have the cells which are slightly larger with more eosinophilic cytoplasm, which would be your macrophages in this case. But along with them, you also have the population of atypical cells with appreciable nucleoli, large cells, which raise the suspicion of LP cells, right? You see more areas and you come across more of these types, which look like basically popcorn cells with vesicular nuclei, appreciable, but not very prominent nucleoli, unlike Hodgkin reed sternberg cells. So you know what to do next. You'll have to go into an IHC profile and look for the same kind of positivity in the same fashion that I talked about, right? Uh, the background population, predominantly small B cells, these atypical large cells, again, mature B cells, surrounded by a collar of CD3 positive T follicular helper cells. An interesting thing that we see with CD20 in this particular case highlights what I've already told. You have these nodules, which are naturally B cell rich nodules, but at some places, these nodules seem to be coalescing into something bigger, right? So these serpentine areas where the nodules coalesce is what sets the, the pattern B aside from the pattern A. Okay, it sets it apart. Uh, so the pattern A would have these nodules as separate, while in pattern B, you have these nodules coalescing. And this is something which is picked up both by CD20 as well as the follicular dendritic markers like CD21 and CD23. So again, with CD20, we see that the background population, background small cell population is predominantly of B cell nature. However, your atypical LP cell population is also composed of mature large B cells, right? But again, you observe a zone of negativity around these atypical large cells, meaning that these will be surrounded by your CD3 positive rosettes. In this particular case, instead of using OCT2 and BOB1, they've used PU1 as a nuclear transcription factor, but we see that this mature B cell associated transcription factor, PU1 is expressed both in the, neoplas uh, both in the neoplastic large LP cells and also in the background B cells with an equal intensity. This is the pattern C of NLPHL, wherein you see that there are these large nodules, but at the same time, there seems to be a kind of a spillover 
beyond this these nodules so there is a mottling which extends beyond the rim of these nodules this is because in these particular cases uh, your uh, lp cells basically spill over from the nodules into the adjacent space okay so here you have got these nodules and you have got a zone of mottling next to the nodules where you are going to find histiocytes along with your lp cells so you see a predominance of the small lymphoid cells which are basically your background small b cell population but you get these mottled areas which look more pink where you are going to find your histiocytes and your lp cells so i guess you can see this zone of mottling around here you can identify slightly larger cells with more polygonal appearance and more abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm these are the histiocytes there is a the macrophages and within them you will if you look closely you will get a sparse population of your atypical lp cells right for example these are the atypical lp cells which you are seeing over here more areas show you the same kind of cells actually like say for example here here you could actually go on a lp cell site seeing spree right so here here okay so there are many lp cells basically lp like cells which are seen in this region again you will have to use ihc in order to settle the issue of whether it's an lp cell or, the, or whether it's an hodgkin cell because a few of these cells seem to have a bit of little bit of more prominence of the of the of the nucleolus which you would see in a hodgkin reed sternberg cell so that issue will need to be settled again multiple areas of the tumor showing this atypical population of lp cells right again same set of markers cd20 shows you the background small b cell population it also highlights the atypical lp cell population but again there is a zone of negativity because this will be this zone of negativity coloring the atypical lp cell is the zone of t follicular helper cells so they will stay in with cd3 right so cd20 shows with cd20 you see that these atypical large cells are present both within the nodules and they have also spread beyond the nodules into the adjacent tissue so if you look into those areas you will again find the same kind of population of the atypical lp cells the large cells which show you the positivity on the on the membrane with cd20 which is again surrounded by the negative colors of cd3 expressing t follicular helper cells which are, which we shall see with the cd3 ihc slide oct2 the nuclear transcription factor for the mature b cells is strongly positive in this atypical large cell population as is expected in the case of the nodular lymphocyte predominant hodgkin lymphoma cd3 like i said cd3 highlights the color around the lp cell can you see the lp cell over here in the middle of the color so this cd3 expressing cells small t cells are, are the t follicular helper cells which basically form rosettes around the atypical lp cell population you could view the same kind of population the same population with different markers these will also stay in with cd4 of uh, like most of the times these will also stay in with pd1 cd57 etc so cd3 again even outside the nodule cd3 shows you a positivity forming a color around the lp cell pd1 shows you the same kind of pattern like i said those cd3 expressing cells will also express pd1 so this cd3 expressing colors are also highlighted with pd1 immunostain so that's all about the pattern b and pattern c pattern b means there will be a coalescence of the nodules that you saw in the pattern a while pattern c would mean that there is a jump out of the lp cells from the nodules into the adjacent space okay the most important differential diagnosis of nlphl nodular pattern is the lymphocyte rich classic hodgkin lymphoma now keep in mind that these two are two entirely different category of diseases right one is nlphl the other is your classic hodgkin lymphoma which is of a different spectrum but the two can look more or less similar and also keep another important thing in mind that ihc profile of the two diseases might overlap now this is very important because we have been uh, taught in our mbbs days that uh, the lp cells of nlphl will be positive for cd45 will be positive for cd20 and negative for 15 and cd30 right 
while the hodgkin reed sternberg cell will show you the exact opposite kind of a pattern they will be negative for cd45 and cd20 and positive for cd15 and 30 now in the case of lymphocyte rich variety of classic hodgkin lymphoma you might get a negativity for cd15 you might get a positivity for cd20 and also you might get a unexpected positivity for the nuclear transcription factors like oc2 and bob1 which men, which are usually not expected to be seen in the case of hodgkin reed sternberg cells keep that in mind and overall the histological pattern and the architecture of a nodular pattern lymphocyte rich classic hodgkin lymphoma is similar to that of nlphl observe this case now this case is not nlphl this is a case of lymphocyte rich classical hodgkin lymphoma but the pattern is predominantly nodular and you see this focal mottled kind of appearance even within these nodules at a higher power, you see that the background population is predominantly small lymphoid cells, but you have also a mottled appearance where you have cells with more pinkish kind of an appearance, larger cells, right? So in these mottled areas, you have the histiocyte-like cells, but you also have a population of larger cells, which will need to be accounted for. What are these? Are these LP cells? Are these hodgkin reed sternberg cells or what? So if you look into these areas at a higher power, you see that the couple of these atypical cells have got the features like binucleation, although they don't have the nucleolus as uh, as prominent as you see in the case of the Hodgkin reed sternberg cells. So you have these atypical, uh, I mean, atypical large lymphoid cells where you still doubt whether this could be LP cells, right? You see different areas of the same tumor, and then you are more or less satisfied that this is likely a Hodgkin reed sternberg cell that you are dealing with because you get this characteristic binucleate owl eye appearing cells which look like reed sternberg cells but of course you need to satisfy your impression with an immunohistochemistry profiling which we will see subsequently so you've got all these atypical cells which belong to the Hodgkin reed sternberg cells which we shall see with IHC now I've settled the entire IHC issue in a single slide uh, you get a few uh, kind of profiles which are expected and a couple of those and, a, and one of those which is really not. Like for example, you see that within this atypical large cell population, you get a membranous positivity for CD20, right? And this cell otherwise looks a bit like the binucleate owl eye appearance of the reed sternberg cell. So this is one point against a classical Hodgkin reed sternberg cell, cell profile because in a classical Hodgkin reed sternberg cell, you don't expect a membrane positivity for CD20. That would be more the domain of NLPHL, right? So this is against a possibility of a classic Hodgkin reed sternberg cell. But at the same time, on CD45, you see that there is a loss of expression. There is no expression of CD45, as you can see. So a negativity of CD45, which fits in with the Hodgkin reed sternberg cell. What about PAX5? The important thing about PAX5 is that in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, PAX5 will be expressed, but it will be expressed in a much weaker intensity compared to the normal background small B cells. So here you have the normal small background B cells, which express PAX5. And in comparison with that, your binuclear cells express PAX5 at a much lower intensity. So this is again another point which is in favor of the Hodgkin reed sternberg cells, right? So you have got two positive findings over here. One, the absence of CD45, one, the weak expression of PAX5. You also have two points in favor of Hodgkin reed sternberg cell, that is the expression of CD15 and CD30. Okay, so you have four points in favor of a Hodgkin reed sternberg cell. Adding more weightage to your diagnosis is the positivity on in situ hybridization for Epstein Barr virus encoded RNA, which is often associated with classic Hodgkin lymphoma, but is not seen usually in nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So, the only odd man out in this scenario would be the CD20 positivity, which is seen in the atypical large cells. Now, as I've already said, lymphocyte rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma is. You know, it's a little bit of an outlier when we talk about the classical Hodgkin lymphoma because this particular subtype can show positivity for CD20. Okay. Now, uh, this is another case where you see these large nodules exhibiting a kind of a uh, kind of a mottled pattern. This is also a case of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma, and within these nodules, you see that you have this population of 
Hodgkin like cells, atypical large cells, and also the binuclear cells, which look like Reed Sternberg cells. You also get some of these mummy, uh, I mean, some of these mummified cells, which is again a morphological variant of the histology uh, spectrum of the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. CD20 shows you that these nodules are predominantly rich in small B lymphocytes. And this would be the same kind of architectural milieu that you also see in the case of NLPHL, right? So that way, these two look similar. The background is predominantly B cell rich. And within this B cell rich background, you also get the population of the larger B cells. And these larger B cells are basically surrounded by your collarets of CD3 expressing and PD1 expressing T follicular helper cells. Now, this is another point of similarity between the NLPHL and lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma. This zone of color of uh, the T follicular helper cells around the atypical cell population. So keep that in mind. CD21 highlights the, I mean, basically the expanded follicular dendritic cell meshwork that you see over here. This would also be something that you see in the case of NLPHL. PAX5, however, shows a much weaker intensity of staining in these atypical large cells. And that is not something that you would see in an NLPHL. In an NLPHL, the LP cells would express PAX5 with as strong an intensity as those of the background small B cells. Over here, the PAX5 expression is much weaker, dim. CD30 and CD15 are expressed, although the CD15 is really not uh, that, uh, you know, it's not that classic kind of expression, but we'll take it for granted that this, both these markers are expressed and hence we are dealing with the case of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So like I already said, you can talk about this entire Hodgkin lymphoma disease as a kind of a, you know, spectrum at one end of which is NLPHL, but these two are completely different diseases. And the other is classic Hodgkin lymphoma. These two are completely different set of diseases with their own uh, immunohistochemical profile. But sitting in the gray zone somewhere is your lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma, which technically speaking, although it is a part of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma family, it straddles the gray zone with a lot of sometimes a lot of immunophenotypic overlap with NLPHL. And that makes it very difficult to sometimes differentiate an NLPHL from a nodular pattern lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So NLPHL would usually not have CD30 and CD15. It will often not express MOM1, which is a post-germinal marker. It will be strongly positive for CD20 and all B cell transcription factors. On the other hand, a classic Hodgkin lymphoma will usually express CD30 and CD15. Post-germinal marker, MUM1 will be usually strongly expressed and CD20 is usually not expressed. The B cell transcription factors will also not be expressed in the classic Hodgkin lymphoma. But within this classic Hodgkin lymphoma, this family, this subtype, that is the lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma, will sometimes not express CD15. This is important. And sometimes will express CD20, thus creating a differential diagnostic issue with NLPHL. So keep that in mind next time when you have a differential diagnosis between an NLPHL and a lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma, sometimes the differentiation can be troublesome. And B-cell transcription factors will also, like OC2, BOB1, can also be sometimes expressed in the case of lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma, classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Just to highlight the same thing, we've got these two sets of slides. The first is a classic Hodgkin lymphoma the second is again a classic Hodgkin lymphoma, but in this case, we are talking about the lymphocyte-rich subtype of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And the third one is nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. We have analyzed these cases on the basis of expression of the nuclear B cell transcription factors, OCT1 instead of OCT2 and BOB1. You see that you expect the OCT1 and BOB1 to be positive in NLPHL, the large cell population, right? And you see that you do not expect them to be positive in the hodgkin reed sternberg cells of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And you see the same thing, that these large cells do not express OCT1 or BOB1. However, the lymphocyte-rich classical, I mean, classic Hodgkin lymphoma, as I said, straddles the gray zone because the hodgkin reed sternberg cells over here can express the OCT1 and BOB1, thus giving rise to a differential diagnostic issue with NLPHL. And what about the rosetting of those T cells around those atypical large cells. Again, on top, we have got the classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Below that, we have got the lymphocyte-rich subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And after that, we have got the NLPHL. 
So in NLPHL, you expect to see the CD3 positive rosettes around the LP cells. You do not expect to see those rosettes in the case of the conventional classic Hodgkin lymphoma. As you see, there is no such rosettes. However, in the case of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma, you do get a rosette of T cells around the hodgkin rich Sternberg cell. Again, that is another point in which the lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma can show a immunohistochemical overlap with nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's all about the classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the lymphocyte-rich subtype. Just like NLPHL, the background will be predominantly rich in small B cells. You will have the CD45 negative uh, hodgkin rich Sternberg cells and uh, these will be surrounded often with a collar of rosetting T-cells, which show the same immunophenotype as those of the rosetting cells in NLPHL. The hodgkin rich Sternberg cells are usually CD20 negative, but sometimes they can express CD20, thus creating a differential diagnostic problem with NLPHL. OC2 and BOB1 are usually negative up to 90%, but the odd case can show you a nuclear positivity for OC2 and BOB1. PAX5 expression is weak, unlike the strong nuclear PAX5 expression of NLPHL. CD15 is often positive, but again, see the percentage, 75 to 85 percentage of cases. So a few cases will be negative for CD15. That should not rule out your differential diagnosis of classic lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin lymphoma. CD30, however, is positive in almost nearly all the cases, and you get that positivity in a membrane and Golgi zone kind of a positivity. Now, so the nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma and the lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular type can thus have a morphologic and immunohistochemical overlap. Keep that in mind because the, uh, because the, the lymphocyte-rich type of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, just like NLPHL, can sometimes show positivity for OCT1, OCT2, Bobon. It can sometimes show a bright PAX5 positivity. It can also show membranous positivity for CD20 and often time it will show the microenvironment which is similar to that of NLPHL that is many small B cells and the T cells forming rosettes around the HRS cells. But it's important to differentiate between the two right because the two have completely different set of outcomes. In the case of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma the patient is although in most of the cases the the prognosis is you know, pretty decent. However, a significant proportion of those cases might develop recurrences in the case of NLPHL. And with those recurrences, there is a chance that you might have a transition into a higher grade histology like a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma or a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And these cases will behave in an aggressive fashion. On the other hand, the lymphocyte-rich type of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma will, like NLPHL, present with peripheral lymphadenopathy, However, they've got a better prognosis and they do not have the association with the increased relapse risk as you see in the case of a nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. The management profile would vary between the two diseases in the case of advanced disease. Right? For example, in the case of NLPHL, if you have an early stage disease with 1A stage, you will probably just give involved field radiotherapy. With, bulk, uh, with 1B disease, that is those patients who have got B symptoms in addition to stage 1 or with stage 2, you will manage the NLPHL case just like a conventional classic Hodgkin lymphoma with ABPD and involved field radiotherapy regime. So in that case of stage 1 to 2 disease, the protocols will be more or less similar. The problem will happen once you have a higher stage disease. Like for example, in the case of NLPHL, once you have a progression to stage 3 or stage 4 disease, these cases oftentimes behave like T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma or DLBCL. And these cases of high-stage NLPHL are better managed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma-like treatment regimes of rituximab and CHOP. On the other hand, in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, if it is of an advanced stage, you would like to give six cycles of ABVD or BACOP along with causative treatment with brentuximab. The other important differential diagnosis of an NLPHL nodular pattern is something which is non-neoplastic. It's called progressive transformation of germinal centers. And although non-neoplastic, this condition is important to keep in mind because some of those cases on follow-up will turn out to be nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Or sometimes a case of NLPHL, if on follow-up you have a you have a lymph node enlargement and you do a biopsy, you might see that you have you have come across a 
progressive transformation of germinal center in, in, in this case. So what is exactly seen in these cases, like, you, uh, like if you see in this particular case, we have these small follicles of varying size, small to medium sized follicles, which are spread throughout the lymphonal parenchyma. However, a few of these follicles are pretty large compared to the background follicular population, almost six to eight times larger than those of the background follicular population. And this is the diagnostic hallmark of progressive transformation of germinal centers or PTGC. Some of the, some of the follicles are expanded into large nodules, which are much larger than those of the adjacent smaller follicles. So if you see, you have got such large gigantic nodules over here. And you see a bit of a, uh, kind of a, a stipple, uh, kind of a uh, moth-eaten appearance at the center of the germinal center, a mottled kind of a pattern. So what is happening within these large nodules is that there is an expansion of the mantle zone population of small lymphocytes, and these are basically encroaching into the germinal centers and breaking up the normal germinal center population, right? So if you see this particular follicle, you will see that there is an ingrowth of these small dark cells into this into the germinal centers of this, uh, I mean, of these follicles, right? And this ingrowth of the mantle cells results in the expansion of the follicles in these areas. So if you see, this is your follicle. This is your expanded mantle zone. The mantle zone, small B lymphocytes can be picked up with dual immunostains for IgM and IgD. Okay, so these cells are seen to infiltrate and encroach into the germinal centers. You can see that the large slightly larger germinal center cells are broken apart by these small dark lymphoid cells which have migrated from the mantle zones into the germinal centers, right? So you have the germinal cell, I mean, you have the germinal center population of centrocytes, centroblast, et cetera, and you have the encroaching population of the small lymphoid cells from the mantle zone, right? So you have this germinal center population and the mantle zone population. So you can see the centroblast of the germinal center and these are the small, B cells of the mantle zone, which are and uh, which are encroaching and breaking apart the germinal center. CD20 just shows that these follicles are composed of B cells, which is what we expect to see. CD3 shows that there is a scanty, there is a relatively scanty population of T follicular helper cells within the follicles, and the intrafollicular spaces are having, as we know, these are the paracortical zones, and these are rich in CD3 expressing cells. And over here, with a follicular dendritic marker like CD23, you see that this follicular that this nodular proliferation is basically follicular centric, resulting in expansion of the follicular dendritic cell meshwork. So this was about the histological, the uh, about the common histological patterns A, B, C, and their morphologic mimics like a lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma and a progressive transformation of germinal center. The other important patterns, then these are the variant patterns that you get in the case of NLPHL, is where the background population from the B cell rich appearance changes over to a predominantly T cell rich background. So instead of large number of B cells, here in the background we have predominantly T cells with a smaller proportion of B cells. And within that T cell rich background, you have this atypical large cell population of the LP cells, which are the same nature of immunophenotype as those of the prior patterns that we have described. However, appreciating the, the rosetting around these cells of the T cells in a T cell rich background would be comparatively difficult. How do you differentiate between the pattern D and pattern E? Also, uh, although the background is the same, same in both the cases, you have a nodular pattern which can be appreciated in pattern D. While in pattern E, there is absolutely no, no nodular pattern. The entire lymph node is effaced by a diffuse sheet-like architecture. How will you substantiate that diagnosis? You can utilize IHC for CD21 and CD23. In the case of a pattern E, you will find absolutely no follicles highlighted. It will, be, it will be a predominantly diffuse kind of a pattern with your LP cells, which are scattered in the background of extensive T cell rich background, right? And the, the importance of this pattern is that is it basically overlaps with your T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma, which is a completely different disease, right? It's a high grade non Hodgkin lymphoma of the B cell type. So you will need to differentiate THR LVCL from a pattern E nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So as this particular picture shows, you have got six types of patterns in NLPHL out of which from A to D, you have got predominantly nodular architecture. 
out of these four, only the pattern D has got a T cell rich background, while the rest will have a predominantly B cell rich background. The, the pattern A is distinct in the sense that you don't have a nodular pattern and is it's a predominantly T cell rich background, while in the pattern F, again, it's a diffuse pattern, but the appearance is predominantly B cell rich, but with a moth eaten kind of, a, uh, but with a moth eaten kind of an appearance. This various patterns can be highlighted with a single marker like CD20. So in this particular slide, all the, all the illustrations of the IHC are based on CD20. So with the pattern A, you get these separate nodules of B, of B cell rich nodules. With a pattern B, you have a coalescence of these nodules resulting in this serpentine anastomosing arrays. In a pattern C, you have these nodules, but you have a spread out of the LP cells from the nodules into the adjacent area. In the case of pattern D, you don't really appreciate a very prominent nodular architecture because the IHC that we are utilizing is CD20. And basically the nodules will be composed of CD3 rich cells. So you're not seeing them properly. In the case of pattern E, you will not get a nodular architecture at all. Instead of that, you will ju just get a diffuse background. And on that, you will have these atypical LP cells scattered in the T cell rich background. So these are the various NLPHL patterns, right? You have got those patterns in which you have a predominant nodular pattern. The pattern A, where you have them as discrete and pattern B, where they can join together. In both these cases, the nodules will be predominantly B cell rich. And in this, you will have the atypical LP cells, which are also of the B cell type, and they will be surrounded by the colors of the T helper cells. If there is a spread out from these nodules into the extra nodular space, this is a pattern C. So the pattern A and pattern B account for around 75% of the cases of NLPHL, while all the other patterns together constitute your variant patterns, okay? And out of these variant patterns, so the around 25% of the cases are of NLPH are expected to be variant patterns. So in this particular variant patterns, the most important one to identify would be your pattern E, where there is absolutely no nodular architecture. It's a diffuse sheet-like pattern. And instead of the B cell rich background, which we are accustomed to seeing, we will get a T cell rich background. And because of this diffuse architecture and the abundance of the T cells, you will confuse the cases of pattern E with a completely different lymphoma, which is a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma, which is a high grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay. In this particular context, use of CD21 and CD23 would be very useful because presence of even focal nodular architecture with these immunostains would tilt your balance towards a pattern E, that is T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma with of NLPHL. If you do not see any follicular architecture, then you will probably call it a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma and not an NLPHL. But that is just one of the criteria. We have got other, you have got multiple criteria to differentiate an NLPHL pattern E from a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. One fact that used to be stressed in the, uh, in the articles a few days back would be that uh, the background T cell population in the case of T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma are predominantly of CD8 type cytotoxic T cell type, while those of the NLPHL pattern are more often of the CD4 type. But this is not always true. In fact, the two, the two journal articles that I have in, uh, I mean, that I've included in this particular discussion show scenarios where you have an abundance of CD4 cells, even in the context of T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. So keep that in mind. That particular issue might happen. And uh, so this particular case is an NLPHL where you have a pattern E. So you have nodular architecture, which is seen over here, but you have these areas where there is a predominantly diffuse sheet-like architecture, right? And within these areas, you have a population of small lymphoid cells, but you also have a substantial proportion of atypical large cells, right? And these atypical large cells at some places look like your LP cells. At some, they look like centroplasts. And in some areas, they even look like your hodgkin reed sternberg cells, okay? So you will need IHC to settle the diagnostic issue. But although the IHC will help to settle the differential diagnostic issue between a uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, NLPHL, the phenotype of this atypical large cell population will be the same in both the NLPHL pattern E as well as the THR-LVCL. So that way, 
ISC will not be absolutely useful when it comes to talking about the large cell population. So we proceed with the immunostains. What do you see? CD20 shows that there is almost virtual absence of CD20, while CD3 shows that diffusely T cell rich background in this particular case. Going ahead with CD3, we find that within the T cell rich background, you have these larger atypical cells, which are not highlighted with CD3, obviously, because these are basically CD20 expressing LP cells. And here, they are again surrounded by the colors, but of course, appreciating the color of these cells in a background which is diffusely CD3 positive would be a bit difficult. Right? These atypical large cells are, like I said, they are LP cells with a mature B cell profile, so they will express membrane positivity for CD20. These being mature B cells will also express the nuclear transcription factor. Bob1, you expect the same kind of positivity in these atypical cells also with OCT2, P1, etc. Just to differentiate from the HRS cells, we do CD15 and CD30. So these are not Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, and we see no positivity for either CD15 or CD30. CD21 again highlights the predominantly diffuse kind of architecture. However, focally, you get this kind of you know nodular pattern over here. So does establishing the diagnosis of NLPHL with a pattern E and had this particular nodular architecture with CD21 not been highlighted, you would have a major problem in segregating this case from a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. So this is a journal article which shows the diagnostic dilemma of a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma from a pattern E NLPHL. This is a case of T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma you get basically the background small cells, which will be T cells. And within them, you have a sparser population of these large atypical cells, which are highlighted with a B cell marker CD20. So these are your cells, which can resemble your LP cells, right? The background is basically rich in CD3 expressing cells, which will express the usual, which in this case express the usual CD4, PD1, etc. So although some journal articles say that T-cell histiocyte rich large B-cell lymphoma is rich in CD8, this particular case, you have the background rich in CD4 helper T-cells. So as per the WHO criteria, T-cell histiocyte rich large B-cell lymphoma, in order to reach the diagnosis, you should have a diffuse effacement of the lymph node architecture. You should not have a... Uh, you should not have a nodular architecture at all. And that will be aided by your utilizing CD21 or CD23 stain to showcase the presence or the absence of follicular dendritic cell. If there is any follicular dendritic cell meshwork, it, it shows that there is a nodular component to this particular tumor. And you are better off diagnosing such a case as NLPHL pattern E. You will, in the background of the T cell rich background, you will get large B cells, which will be scattered. Unlike a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, these large atypical B cells will never will, will never constitute a huge population. They'll be less than 10% of the neoplastic cell population. Along with that, you will also get a population of plump histiocytes within which are mixed up with those scattered atypical large B cells. This is another case of a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. So as you see over here, the <clears throat> you have got a background of small cells. You have also these atypical larger cells, which could be sometimes confused with an LP cell. These cells are naturally mature B cells, and they will express CD20. The background is CD3 positive. It is predominantly rich in CD3 expressing cells. CD23 shows that there is absolutely no nodular architecture to this tumor. So there is no follicular dendritic meshwork. And because it is absolutely diffuse without any nodular component, we will not call it an NLPHL pattern. We will call it a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. Okay. And the importance of identifying the T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma is that these usually segregate in the age group of the elderly patients. Such patients usually present with a stage three to four systemic disease. So if you have a low stage disease like stage one or two, and if you are having a histology like that, be very careful you are probably mistaking an NLPHL of pattern E for a T-cell histiocyte-rich large vessel lymphoma. Although keep in mind that NLPHL pattern E will be often associated with high-stage disease. And such patients of THRBCL usually will have B symptoms, which are markers of high, high volume, and along with splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, and they are usually refractory to chemotherapy treatment. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. 
This was another case of T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma happening in the spinal region. And the histology is the same. You have got the background population of small T cells with the larger population of atypical B cells. On using CD21, you see that there is absolutely no follicular dendritic component in this particular case. So there is no nodular architecture to it. It's entirely diffuse. So this is another case of T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. Uh, and a subset of such cases can show overlap with NLPHL pattern E. Moving on with the same case, we look at the extended immune profile of these atypical large cells. So as we know, these atypical large cells in THRLBCL are of mature B cell phenotype, just like NLPHL. So they will express strongly CD20 transcription factors like PAX5 will be strong. And EMA, just like NLPHL, EMA can be expressed even in these cases. Uh, the post-germinal marker, MOM1, IRF4, will be positive in these cases. And that's a diagnostic clue towards a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. Unlike uh, hodgkin reed sternberg cells, you will not get expression of CD30 or CD15. Neither will you get expression of EBV-associated RNA on in-situ hybridization. The, uh, the mixed up population of macrophages will be highlighted with CD68. The background will be predominantly CD3. Like some journal articles have told, usually you expect in a THRBCL the background to be CD8 cytotoxic T cell rich. However, even in this particular case, the background was rich predominantly in CD4 T cells. So at the end of the day, how will you differentiate the NLPHL of pattern E? from a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. That is important because NLPHL, as soon as you give a diagnosis of NLPHL to the clinician, he is happy. And because you know NLPHL is often associated with a low-stage disease, while THRLBCL is a very aggressive disease with a stage 3 or stage 4 kind of presentation. So you will need to take um, ample amount of care to segregate the two. Oftentimes, it will be difficult keep that in mind but you will still try to utilize the constellation of findings so for example if the patient is younger in age and if the and if the disease is not really disseminated if you have a stage one or a stage two kind of disease that would favor nlphl while an elderly patient with a disseminated disease would more likely be having a t-cell histiocyte rich large b-cell lymphoma <clears throat> coming to the morphology uh, the immunophenotype of the atypical large cell population is not going to be of much help because the atypical LP cells of NLPHL and the atypical large B cells of THRLBCL more or less have a similar immunophenotype. Although the lack of BCL6 and expression of MUM1 would more likely favor the diagnosis of a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. What about the immunophenotype of the background population? Again, the T cell background would be of importance. Like in this particular journal article, and also as some of the journal articles say, in the case of T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma, the predominant background cell population will, will be of the CD8 type. While in the case of the NLPHL pattern E, the predominant immunophenotype will be of the T follicular helper type with positivity for CD4 and CD57. But again, keep in mind the possibility that nowadays we are getting articles that are coming up with the fact that even THR LBCL can have a CD4 rich background. And what about markers like CD1, uh, like CD, CD21 and CD, CD23? These are basically follicular dendritic cell markers. So if there is any highlighting of follicular dendritic cell rich nodules within a tumor which otherwise looks diffuse, it will favor a diagnosis of nodular uh, of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. So we have almost reached the end of discussion of this particular topic. As you see, NLPHL, although the name suggests a single disease, is basically a constellation of multiple types of histological presentations. On one side, you, you could have a histology like pattern A and B, where you would have a differential diagnostic issue of a progressive transformation of germinal centers or a classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the lymphocyte rich subtype. On the other hand, you can have a high grade aggressive histologic pattern like pattern E, where your main differential diagnosis would be an entirely unrelated high grade non Hodgkin lymphoma of the B cell type known as T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. You shall have to trade your way 
slowly but surely with a large set of immunohistochemical markers in order to properly assess whether you are dealing with an NLPHL or one of those histological mimics. Like as is seen in this particular slide, on one end, you could have a histological mimic of a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma. And on the other, in the, low, in the low stage cases, you could have a differential diagnosis of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma or a progressive transformation of germinal centers. So with that, I reach the end of this discussion. The next discussion that will follow up in another video is uh, that of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Bear in mind that that's a much, much bigger topic. So it will stretch probably into two hours or more. I'm not yet sure whether I'm going to make a single video out of it or split it up into multiple subcategories. You could write in your suggestions in the comments box below. Uh, and with that, bye. See you in the next.